very happy to be here. I'm Tang, um, University of Missouri Extension. I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to share with you some of the experience and some of the um, basic data that we've collected from a mid Missouri dairy lagoon uh, in terms of the lagoon um, sludge removal, um, some of the data that we're seeing so far. So um, I will go over some of the background of the dairy farm in the lagoon. Uh, more importantly, to document some of the procedures uh, that we took to uh, help um, do the uh, lagoon sludge removal, um, presenting some of the equipment, uh, talking about the crew, uh, and then the need to do the dilutions. Uh, and then pairing up with some of the uh, nutrient management plan information, making sure that uh, the land, uh, the acreage to apply those were there. Uh, and also talking a, a little bit about what we saw in the lagoon effluents that we collected um, daily from, from that operations. So um, this is a fairly small to nowadays standard the dairy barn itself. It housed uh, about 160 in in that particular freestall barn that is um, um, discharging um, the solids into the uh, lagoon that we're looking at. Um, at the same time, the lagoon is also receiving um, the wastewater from the milking parlor. So this is uh, looking to the north this way. So we're facing east this way. Um, so there was two water towers flashing. Um, and in the old days, there was a slope screen. I have some photos to show you. Uh, that basically was abandoned about eight, nine years ago. Um, so that, that caused the problem uh, that eventually that lead to the, um, uh, the significant accumulations of the sludge. So um, the freestall barn itself was using mattress bedding with sheetless shavings. And the barn was basically flushed three times a day. So looking north here, this was the, um, the freestall barn that we're talking, the two dairy, dairy uh, water towers that is flushing the water. And that's the uh, incline screen separators that we were talking about. And then some concrete pad here uh, that was designed to take um, temporary storage of the solids that was separated. Um, the lagoon itself is not that big. It's about two and a half acres. Um, we estimated the volume of that lagoon when it's almost full was about seven and a half million gallons. Um, so the problem was that over the years, there was significant solids build out. Um, and you'll see why that this was uh, the concrete pad that I pointed out earlier. Um, so that was the abandoned um, inclined solid screen separator there. Um, Let's be clear that the barn, uh, the three store barn uh, and the lagoon and the operations, they did receive um, the um, a minimal of uh, agitations every year when, when they, the farm crew did, did the uh, uh, pump out. Um, but the problem is that because of, um, there was so much lagoons, uh, solids build up that um, by, by about 2020, we did see some islands uh, this you cannot see very clearly because that was almost the fullest uh, of, of the time when the lagoon was uh, right before the pump out. So here's the plan and I want to stress the, the important part that that was the plan that to document the, uh, the, the lagoon desludging, uh, we wanted to start with a proper sludge sampling with the, so that we can better estimate the volume. Um, we made sure um, that uh, we, we, we have communicated with the nearby neighbors that uh, there are fuels that we can apply because we know there will be uh, a lot of sludge that we want to apply. So the land that the, the dairy farm itself had probably wasn't enough. So we made sure of that um, because of the lack of equipment and, and crew that this was a job that was went out, that went out for a bit. So we contacted several uh, regional um, manure haulers to try to get um, their information for the bidding. Um, and then our job was basically to monitor the volume and the nutrients removed uh, and, and making sure of that. So this is a, a more recent soil sampling data that we had from that, from that particular dairy barn. And again, that was the, uh, the dairy lagoons. The, uh, it's a very small, again, very small uh, freestall barn looking over here. 
the farm itself has about 200 acres of uh, fields that can uh, be land applied for that over the years. Uh, and in this case, we've um, uh, made sure that the neighbors has about 400 acres of lands available for the land applications. So looking at the map here, the green colors mean that uh, this is particular to specific to the phosphorus, that the, um, uh, the green color area was the one that has already um, high in phosphorus, so preferably no more phosphorus applications. Yellow means that the uh, desired maintenance require that if you want to apply, you can, and then red meaning that uh, feel free to apply more phosphorus. So the lessons learned here, and sure enough, we have talked about this at many farms that the lands or the fields that are closer to the source or to the barns are typically those that receive the most uh, manure land applications of the years. And, and then as you can see here, it is true that the, the numbers do tell uh, how much they are accumulated over the years. So um, a little bit about the sludge sampling. Uh, we have talked to a couple of the, the regional uh, sludge probe, probing team. Those are the folks that who, who do a lot of the commercial in our area. There are smaller townships that still rely on uh, small scale of lagoon for their municipal waste management. So there are people that who do that quite frequently. So they lay out a plan that they were planning and suggesting to do 24 readings in which we agree on. Uh, wanting to find out the water depth and the sludge levels um, before we, we had the job go out for a bit. And then they estimated the cost for doing this um, sludge sampling work to be about uh, $2,600 $2. for that. So we quickly went into um, doing the sludge surveys. And then unfortunately, uh, the issues was that the lagoon was, um, was full uh, and then there were so much of the solids in there. Uh, the, the crew tried two different boats, larger ones and smaller ones, and every time when they got the boats in there, uh, they didn't, uh, was unable uh, to move the, the boat safely. So we, we, we didn't really get too much of data out of it. Uh, with the, the effort that they put in, and also we, we tried to do our own uh, from the shore type of uh, custom sludge judge sampler. That, so we had our own sample, and then there was two uh, samples that they have tried to take. Uh, by all means, these are not representative of what we wanted because of the limitations. Um, so you can see the different uh, important nutrients contents from those samples. And the uh, very important piece of information is that the moisture content of these samples, uh, they range from 86% to 94%, meaning that the solids content range anywhere from 6% to about 14%. Um, to give you a perspective that the, the manure hauler, the, the, the pumping team have already told us in, in, in a way in advance that they would like to pump the lagoons at about five to 8% solids to avoid any problems with, with the solids clogging the, the whole system. So clearly what this tells us is that there is a need to bring in some water for dilutions to ensure the proper um, pumping of that time. So some of the considerations, um, obviously the cost uh, is what we want to document. Um, we want to, to make it clear to, to the, the bidding crews that we have only a very short time frame to get this done, um, meaning that we have to clean out the lagoons right before uh, when it's planting uh, season. So we want to make sure that they have the proper equipment and experienced crew to come in and 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 then they can get the job done before the, the farmers, uh, the nearby, the neighbors need to do the planting uh, and preferably an experienced and good reputation crew. So we quickly went into um, the, getting the, the agitations. So in this case, uh, what we're looking here is uh, the photo showing both the PTO and the, the remote control agitation boat. Um, for, for this effort that they brought in two PTO, um, Lagoon agitation pump and one, uh, which is this one, the uh, agitation pump. And then we start, they started the job on May 21st. Um, some of the equipment that was used. Um, so this is the primary lagoon pump on the trailer, uh, trailer mounted pump on the, the photo on the left. 
Uh, let's not be confused with dilution pump. We mentioned that because of the high solid contents, the crew knew and then they did bring in another dilution pump to pump the water from a nearby lake or pond uh, to bring additional fresh water into the lagoon to help with the agitation and reduce the, the solid contents. Um, so um, obviously this is a, a drag line operations. Uh, and then some of the fields were far enough, uh, about two miles away. So they ended up using booster pump. Um, so because of this um, larger size, we're talking about eight inches or six inches of the pipelines that specialty equipment like the um, uh, hose cart bumper was needed uh, to help move or direct the lines uh, while the, uh, the tractors is, is injecting the sludge or the, the slurry into the nearby fields. Um, so again, this is the lagoon. As you can see, this is the route that they took to, uh, to lay out the pipe uh, to the nearby fields. So the furthest field is this one. Uh, some of you might ask why, the, why not the directly, because that's because um, they have to take into the considerations um, when you have to cross a route where to lay out the pipe is that culvert that they can utilize. Uh, to minimize the, the uh, disturbances to the, the pipe uh, and damage. So that's that's the one of the routes that they went through. Uh, so the fields, as you can see, that uh, these are the maps that was provided by the contractors. Um, they ended up uh, apply over uh, close to um, 890 acres. The furthest as, as this field is about 1.6 miles, but that is not counting the direct um, uh, layout of those piping. And then, so they started with the furthest field and then they narrow in into the fields. And again, this is the lagoons and then they end up in, in spraying and towards the end on the fields that are closer. Uh, and luckily they were able to avoid those fields that were generally high in the phosphorus, if you remember the, the soil map that we look at. So um, the sampling, um, so that's a key, part that we are talking here, we want to make sure we can get enough samples from this. Um, so the samples, uh, as you can, if you remember the, the slides that we, we struggle with collecting the sludge samples uh, using the sludge chart from using the boat or from the shore. Uh, once we get this equipment set up, it's fairly easy uh, because we could just uh, take some samples from from the main pump itself. So this is showing one of the contractors helping us taking the samples. Uh, we analyzed the, the major nutrients, of course, the moisture content. Uh, and then we send the samples to our University of Missouri soil and plant testing lab. Um, so there are some um, missing data points here. Uh, I wanna stress that that's not because we didn't take the samples, but because the crew that did take the weekends off and then there were days that the that storm came in, so they have to stop that. Um, and then, so we were mostly able to take the samples almost every day when they were doing the land applications. And then there were days that we, we decided to take even more samples, multiple samples per day, just to see, uh, trying to help document if there's significant um, moisture content changes or nutrient changes, uh, which you can see here, uh, a lot of the data are showing that there are only minimal changes. So in general, if you're looking at the black color line here, that's the moisture content, which makes sense. At the very beginning, we were unable to, uh, to bring in the, the, the dilution water. So it, we generally start with the, the lower moisture content. Uh, and then when they start bringing in the dilution water, uh, that the uh, moisture content go up. And then in, uh, in general, that uh, the higher the moisture content, uh, the lower the nutrients uh, that was pumped. Um, by putting the volumes and the concentrations together, uh, we can estimate the mass applications in this terms. It's either in kilogram per hectares or pounds per acres type of values to better document how much total nutrients got applied on those day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we don't have time to go into the details, but in general, as you can see, uh, even with the, the uh, much of a agitations um, that was conducted in a fairly small lagoon, there is still significant amount of fluctuations uh, in terms of the nutrient supply from day to day. 
which indicates that yes, it is true that we uh, in the future we, we will want to lean on to some of those uh, real-time nutrient management uh, nutrient measurements devices to better adjust the rate that we can apply in the field to con better control uh, to come out to a better uh, consistent uh, amount of nutrients that is applied in the field. So the cost. Uh, this particular contractor was uh, knowing that what they have to do, uh, they were just providing a, a average cost. Uh, some of the contractors were tying the cost to the distance to the field, but in this case, this particular one made it very easy. So as you can see, the rate is there. They ended up um, pumping about 25 gallons, uh, applying that much per acres. Um, so the job overall, it's about 8 million gallon pump in about eight days, and the total cost was about $151,000. Um, so the conclusions, uh, we didn't have time to go into the safety. Um, there have been cases that during lagoon agitations that there is dangerous uh, off gassing from the lagoon. So people have to be reminded that there is that part to be uh, paying attention to. Um, some of the data that we're seeing here, clearly there is very difficult to do the, to get to the homogeneous um, land application. So it's very difficult to achieve even with the, the agitations that you saw. Um, nutrient management plan is very important. And if the land is there and the equipment is there, it's still fairly uh, efficient to do the land applications in terms of the uh, solids removal. Um, learning from that, the, the farm know that they, they have to catch up and make sure after the, uh, the sludge removal, they want to make sure that they have the uh, removal um, so that we have some, I'll conclude with some of the photos. And by the way, some, a lot of these informations are uh, published in a journal, con uh, in the paper, in a, in a conference here. Um, so as I mentioned, after the removal, the farm chose to uh, install what we call pool plug sediment basins. And by the way, this is another extension publications that we put together. Um, here are some photos uh, that showing that this particular sediment basins is catching both the saddle solids and also uh, the crust uh, over the time of, of the weeks that they will accumulate. Uh, and then there is this device that allows the, uh, the water, basically the central part of the water to flow out. Uh, so when, when the sludge uh, and also the, the crust get grow up, grow over the, the weeks, um, the, the, the farmers can um, drain the liquid pot and then move in with the machinery to remove the solids. So um, I want to um, conclude by thanking you, the collaborators on this, uh, Tim Cantor, Joe Zulovich, and also Rick Stoll from University of Nebraska. Special thanks to the NRCS uh, engineers who designed this uh, full plug sediment basin, Troy Chocolate, and of course the, the help from the farm crew and also the custom applicators to make this um, co data collections available. Uh, this is staying my contact. Feel free to contact me if there's any questions. Thanks.